everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of An Introduction to the Art and Science of Chinese Tea Ceremony. Today we're discussing Book 1, Chapter 6, Section 8, Contemporary Economic and Cultural Capital in Chinese Tea Ceremony. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny and Ryan Ah. Hello, Pat. Hey, hey. Hello, Ryan. Hello. My first question. What items and effects represent economic capital today in our general milieu? As it relates to Chinese tea ceremony? No, in our, in our more general culture, the broader culture. Is it a Gucci bag or is it something else? I think uh, it's, it's definitely brands, as you're saying, with a Gucci bag, right? So I think, uh, you know, wearing fresh air Jordans, brand, designer fashion, you know, designer clothes, jewelry. You can take a look at, I think, a lot of what's happening with like music artists and whatever the, you know, top 10, billboard top 10 artists are wearing or doing. Uh, that's that's kind of a lot of what represents, like not cultural capital, right, but economic capital, uh, I think, in our general milieu. And they have to be things that are recognizably expensive, right? It can't just be blue suede shoes. It has to be supreme blue suede shoes. Yeah, if it doesn't have a supreme logo on it, throw it in the garbage. But, uh, you know, uh, a Maserati, right? There's there's things that you see and you know, okay, uh, I can't afford that. Uh, but these people can. And so it represents cultural cap. Or Sorry, I keep saying that. So it represents economic capital. Ryan, do you have anything to add? Is it only brands? Or is there other ways of representing economic capital? a great question. Brands is certainly the most obvious um, thing that comes to mind. You don't see people sitting around mountains of gold anymore. Um, it's a great question. Nothing immediately yeah. comes to mind. I mean, if, if you've got the Scrooge McDuck money bin, that definitely does it. There's some serious economic capital. But um, I guess, you know, there's also, if we try and think beyond brands, the next thing that I go to is uh, property, right? So, uh, I mean, I guess islands can be seen as branded, right? But, uh, you know, having having your second, third mansion or whatever, uh, you know, having your private island, uh, your yacht, your boat, all of those things are kind of that traditional uh, within, within our capitalist society, right? Traditional signals of success for being, you know, full of economic capital. But even in... Uh, items such as uh, yachts, isn't Nordic Swan a brand more valuable than, say, uh, Sunfish? I'm glad you know. Now, Ryan, you're known for being relatively anti-brand. You don't wear branded clothing or branded items. Do you find that individuals uh, have trouble placing you on a spectrum of cultural and economic capital uh, on first impressions or do you believe that there are other ways that they intuitive your relative status based on their interactions with you very quickly? I think in general, placing people, um, there's certainly appearances, which are first impressions. Um, but, you know, it's also the way that, that you talk, the way that you move, the way you think through problems, um, that really every, all of the attributes that make up um, a more uh, complete picture of, of someone um, certainly over time will probably dominate um, their perception of, of where you sit on the economic and cultural capital spectrum. And how does this apply to Chinese tea ceremony today? What items and effects uh, signal economic capital in Chinese tea ceremony today? I would say both are inc extremely important uh, in, in the market for, for buying both tea um, and tea wear. Um, so you can go to the brand name auction houses and with relatively low uh, cultural capital, you can spend lots of money um, bidding up the price of very rare items, porcelain, yixing, um, that type of thing. Um, but for the very rare and very obscure stuff, um, cultural capital will then become a barrier not everyone, not just everyone can buy, um, you know, certain very rare and obscure things because those people literally won't sell them to you. Unless they list it on Grailed, then you can bid on it on Grailed. Ryan's laughing, but I don't think he scrolls through Grailed. Of the tea wares celebrated for its economic capital today, which of those were similar to the tea wares in Yongjin's time? Porcelain is probably the most celebrated because it attracts um, collectors and 
um, people that fall outside of tea as well. Um, so it, it's a larger uh, potential consumer base and larger collector base. Right, I, I would agree with that. I think um, especially when we look at a lot of what, you know, the Qing dynasty and actually previous dynasty, right? Ming uh, is known for, um, people look at uh, vases a lot, right? So porcelain in vases, not even in tea uh, related wares. Um, so you do have a huge draw from porcelain uh, into this kind of world. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure the same could be said of Yixing's to a smaller degree, um, but I do think that the number one that comes to mind is porcelain wares. The adoption of wares made possible by the development of new technologies, such as red glazes like Niu Xiaohong, which is oxblood, oxblood glaze, was a mark of cultural capital in dynastic China. Is the development of new technology still a mark of cultural capital in Chinese tea ceremony, or has our contemporary practice taken on a traditionalist bent? I think it's driven by scarcity. And a lot of the innovations that we see today, um, if they are scarce, then they're highly valued. But if it's an innovation that can scale, um, especially scale in a very economic way, um, then uh, I would say its, it's cultural value deteriorates. Although I would say, trying to take that from the opposite side, um, we do know of right uh, vendors who maybe will do a limited run of Jingdezhen cups, put a little bit of text on the cup, and uh, you know it sells out. And it could be a very high quality cup. Um, from a design perspective, it's very modernist. Uh, but you know that that cup is known to the community and carries some cultural weight. Uh, you know you have to know where to where where to purchase this you have to know why it's special uh you have to have the money for it and then you also probably have to be waiting online you know when it drops um so there's there's some cultural capital to it as well even though it's a quite a modern wear it maybe reflects some of the original design uh aesthetic right of uh, older pieces from the Qing, uh but has very modern bent to it isn't that just the hypification of tea wear I think it's the cutting edge. I think that um, contemporary uh, tea wear, um, um, like the piece Pat was just referring to, is, is um, taking a traditional art form, recognizing that we are practicing a living art and putting on new motifs, new ideas um, that have value and can appeal to a modern day practitioner base. It's not hypification until it's a uh, Supreme collab, as we mentioned earlier. So until I see the word Supreme on these cups, then, you know, it's not hyped enough for me. Well, see, I, I was going to say I thought Ryan is the anti-brand hype beast of tea, um, but you have corrected me. It's Until it's Supreme, it's not hype. Uh, Pat, I don't believe that your answer actually answered the, the question around technology. Is it technology that um, marks cultural capital, or is it now anti-technology that, that marks cultural capital? Not actually sure where to take this one. Um, I think that as we start to see uh, some new technologies in, you know, glazes, uh, for example, right, I think uh, things that look very much like authentic Qianware, uh, you, you're starting to find, you know, Tenmoku style bowls uh, being quite readily available uh, you know, I think this is an understanding of the glaze and how it works, right? So this is kind of a technological uh, advancement. Um, I think achieving the same glaze can be done with a very different level of craftsmanship. Uh, it no longer takes the generations of know-how to repeat it. Uh, and even online, like on Instagram, I get uh, targeted advertisements for 10 Moku bowls uh, because I think, you know, the ability to, to make them, the technology is, is much more readily available. Um, does that mean that that uh, a real gen bull has lost any of its mark of cultural capital? No, I don't think so. Um, but those authentic wares lend uh, more cultural capital to even the newer wares. Uh, many people will see, you know, uh, someone with a ten moku bull, and whether that's an antique gen ware, uh, authentic ware from you know gen yao, uh, or it's a new modern uh, reproduction, most people won't know. Uh, so it's going to lend cultural capital with a lower barrier, thanks to technology. Not sure if that answers it, Jason. Do you feel like that was the right track? I think so. I think that that answers the question. Ryan, do you have a response to that? I think a lot of it has to do with intention. 
So when you see emergence in technologies that allow things to rapidly scale, such as mass-produced porcelain, right? In even in the very, very good examples, or right, maybe some practitioners won't be able to tell a difference um, between that and sort of the original piece that it was trying to emulate, right? The intention that went behind those original pieces in that technological innovation when it happened hundreds of years ago, right, is is the same type of intention we see with other luxury goods. Um, when, you know, when you buy from LVMH, when you buy from any of the luxury houses, even in the, the food and beverage space, like wine, a large part of what you're paying for is, is history, tradition, lineage, intention um, uh, from those producers um, to, to create something that uh, is really unique and special and usually rare. Jason, what's a modern, you know, technological advancement that you can think of applied to Chinese tea ceremony that has shifted, you know, the stage uh, of cultural capital or the focus on it? Electric roasting in Taiwanese oolong, certainly, um, particularly for high fire oolongs, uh, sorry, especially for high mountain oolongs, um, the ability to create those flavor profiles wasn't possible before, and now those are certainly a mark uh, of wealth and knowledge um, for certain for certain teas or certain mountains. For teaware, I believe that the question is, is much harder. I think most of my interest has been actually in individuals recreating, rediscovering uh, older forms of glazing, going back to older, more manual techniques and being able to do those reliably and repeatedly. Um, and I think that that is a little bit of a traditionalist bent and it's worth, it's worth uh, examining um, why we prefer those wares to why we prefer um, wares that are that are closer to the hype beast wares as we were discussing previously. Um, and, I, and I say that owning both. The next question. Uh, I'll read an excerpt from this chapter on ask a, I, I believe a single question on it. The promotion of the imperial style in the Qing dynasty served to further the interests of the court in establishing the legitimacy of the Manchu rule over China. The reigns of Kangxi through Qianlong were marked by rapid development, maturation, and exchange of aesthetic culture, partially overseen by the imperial palace workshop. While the technological innovations were, for the most part, adopted and adapted throughout the empire, only the visual aesthetics which appealed to the contemporaneous Chinese literati society found a receptive audience. My question, why did the imperial style face resistance from the literati? A lot of my understanding is that, you know, the many of the literati uh, were, uh, you know, a Han Chinese, right, or majority Chinese background. Uh, there's a very specific cultivation and enculturation around what is to be uh, considered, you know, of uh, high capital. Um, and, you know, the leadership of the Qing dynasty, uh, being, you know, Manchu, uh, had a slightly different uh, bent to the uh, wares that they were uh, praising, you know, and the aesthetic they were trying to shape and create. Uh, and uh, when those aesthetics didn't meet the same uh, criteria that the literati were looking for, uh, particularly a very Chinese, uh, you know, uh, aesthetic, uh, they, it wasn't uh, well received by the literati. Uh, so I think you included in the chapter, you know, an example of um, some wares that were well received, as well as some that were, you know, uh, quite abnormal uh, for the literati at the time. I think some of those being the uh, Tuan stones, right, the ink stones uh, being made out of different uh, ores or different rocks uh, and, you know, not having the same reception from the literati. To me, it sounds like enculturation um, to some extent, you know. Um, imposing a different set of aesthetic preferences is also imposing a different set of values. Do we have like a, a modern day example of where we feel like we've seen this, uh, where the tastemakers are of a completely different generation, mindset, class uh, than, you know, I, I'd say us or the average person? Did you see the outfits they were wearing at the Met Gala? Hey, well, there you go. <laughs> you know, that doesn't exactly speak to fashion for me. Ryan's anti-brand, but he would certainly wear that cape. I would wear any cape.
it can it can have the Supreme logo on it. We we might get sued by Supreme for this podcast, but um, you know, I I think I'll, I'll go with the the eat the rich dress. That's what I'll wear to to my next uh, you know big event. I think it was tax the rich, but you, your dress needs to say eat the rich. No, no, mine will be eat the rich. But yes, tax the rich was the dress. I'm on board with this. We can get matching. All right. Well, yeah, we have to do different colors at least. Yeah, I'll do black and white. And you'll do white and black. All right, everyone, look out next Tea Technique uh, live event. We're going to call it Between Two Dresses. Instead of Between Two Teapots. I'm <laughs> sure no one, no one will mind that we took that name. Actually, I thought that was a reference to Between Two Ferns, where they stole it from. You know, we have uh, Between Two Coffee Trees or something like coffee, Between Two Coffee Bushes, uh, you know, for us as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of Between Two, isn't there? We'll be okay with that. My follow-up question to that, why is it that, uh, what, what was the fight or what was the mm, struggle between a top-down imposition of an imperial style and the assumption that the populace would take up the imperial style as part of their adaption and acceptance of Manchu culture versus the bottoms up uh, enculturation of aesthetic preferences. Why did those clash in such a strong way um, during the Qing dynasty? So this is an area that I know much less about than both of you, but wasn't it because the everything was made in like imperial kilns? So there is a, it's much easier to have a uh, top-down uh, imposition of aesthetic preferences if you control the artists and the kilns. Right. But I think uh, even with, you know, control of the artist, control of the kilns, uh, that what Jason's saying here is uh, even, even though the emperor has that power and that capital and that wealth, the literati still didn't always take to uh, the, the aesthetic that was being crafted, you know, by the emperor. Um, I, I think it just goes to show the power of, you know, uh, bottoms up adaption in that, you know, we can we could be told in our modern milieu, right? And many times we are told, right, by vendors that uh, X material or XT uh, is the best. You should be buying it. Anything else that you buy is a subpar version of this. Um, and, you know, just because we're told by the, the tastemakers in the tea industry or the vendors, um, you're always going to have people who have a different mindset. And if it's not widely adapted, you're not going to see that bottoms up, uh, you know, trend being driven um, and I think that's that's what we're seeing uh, then, right, in the Qing Dynasty, that uh, the emperor, who is a, definitely a tastemaker and, uh, you know, extremely wealthy uh, individual in terms of both cultural and economic capital, uh, had a had an aesthetic and it was not picked up. And without people to drive it forward, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. We still appreciate it in museums. Um, and today, I think many of us appreciate it. Uh, but we weren't part of the culture at that time that was rejecting it. Uh, we didn't have that background. Isn't that just aligning yourself with the tastemakers of the past? Is it wrong? Is it just retroactive adoption of uh, wealth and power, the taste of wealth and power? Uh, and, you know, I, I would say, I guess it certainly is. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I, as well as uh, both of you, don't have the same reasons to reject the aesthetic that many of the literati at the time had. Uh, so I think our context is very different, right? Um, and of course you're allowed to not like the aesthetic of some of the wares, but, uh, I don't know about you guys when I see that red, uh, monochrome glaze, uh, I can't see it being incorporated into every chashi, but I would kill to use one of those cups. The red monochrome, monochrome oxblood glaze was accepted by the literati. Um, it was, it was things like the Songhua stones, uh, or even some of the, uh, Rurie. Uh, ceramics, the pale blue ceramics that were not accepted. Yeah, I don't know that I would have accepted everything. Uh, I think we maybe we'll have to have, you know, uh, this could be a good idea for future content. We can do a little live session. We'll all look at wares together, uh, you know, scroll through uh, the Met or some other museum's uh, gallery and say why we do or don't like something. And we can find out later, you know, did the literati like it? Do we agree or disagree with the tastemakers of the past? Why are economic and cultural capital so linked? And what is the exchange rate between economic and cultural capital? I'll try and take one part of this, and hopefully uh, I'll spit out some intelligent word salad and Ryan can take it from there. 
but thinking back to a previous chapter, right? Wealth tastes good. Um, having economic wealth, I think, gives you broader access to other forms of wealth. So, you know, uh, it gives you broader access to the knowledge required uh, to, you know, make choices that would purchase things like that have a, a high cultural capital value. Um, so I think in many cases, it takes quite a lot of money to figure out the things that are worth some type of value. Uh, so people don't get into tea, buy a, you know, like $10 Gaiwan, and then the next thing they want to buy is like, you know, antique uh, Yixing or antique porcelain. It just doesn't go that way. I think it takes quite a bit of time of building up both the experience, the formative experiences, the technique, but then also having the capital to take those next steps successively uh, before you can figure out the items that really are those high cultural capital drivers. Um, yeah, no, no one is just going to go from, you know, uh, Jason, in, in this chapter, you have a, a plot, which maybe we won't talk too much about, but it's you're plotting cultural and economic capital uh, against each other. Um, in the very bottom, you know, left of that plot, we see things like cheap gaiwans, uh, cheap tea tables. Uh, and I think those are there not only because they are uh, of a low economic value, um, but because they're also the first things that you encounter as you embark, uh, you know, on uh, your tea journey, uh, you have to have, you know, the money to build up the knowledge to figure out what is of high cultural capital. And that's why I believe they're, you know, somewhat intrinsically linked. Ryan, you want to drive it home a little further? Why, if, if you agree or disagree? Oh, I agree. I think that the, if you think of the distribution of economic capital, and the distribution of cultural capital that you have wares, a lot of them will sit in the middle. Um, and that's, that's why you have a more linear relationship um, in it because- That makes sense. What's the most expensive piece of teaware that the majority of practitioners buy? I would say Yixing teapots. Yeah, Yixing teapots. Almost well. certainly a Yixing teapot. And how much do they normally spend maximum? On, on their single best Yixing. The Jordan. very average, I'm gonna say 200 to $300. And it, I think it's because those distributions look the same that we sit, see such a linear relationship between economic and cultural capital. So you would say that we have a linear exchange rate in our contemporary Western milieu? I think that there's a linear exchange rate within the range of what most people buy. Right, I think we start to see exceptions to that, uh, particularly coming along with experience in that you, you let's say you're a millionaire, you could probably have most of the tea wares that you want. You could certainly have anything that's readily accessible to the market online. Um, is the first thing that you're gonna buy still gonna be like a, you know, Ching, Yixing, and like some Ming cups? Probably not. You still need to have the formative experiences to build your understanding of the framework that is the cultural capital of, of each item, right? Um, so I, I think there is, even if you had unlimited economic capital, you would still need to build those experiences to understand the cultural capital factor. Your journey through these wares is still going to be, I think, quite linear. I agree with you. And my follow-up question to that is, in that case, why do we see so many examples of individuals who want to be tastemakers using such low economic capital wares? I'll first start out with saying, I don't agree that all tastemakers are using low cultural capital wares. I didn't say all. I said, why are okay. so many want so many tastemakers okay. using low, low cultural capital wares? Okay, why are so... so wannabe tastemakers, I'm trying not to say wannabe, but want to be, the individuals who believe themselves to be tastemakers, why are so many of them using $12 guy wands and cheap tea trays? My thought is those are readily accessible items. And so I think uh, the if they understand their audience, it's likely that the people that they're trying to educate are in the early to mid uh, part of their tea journey. Um, you know, these tastemakers are probably a little bit more active in the community and they, they understand who their uh, audience is and they're trying to utilize wares that I think are familiar to 
uh, you know, the majority of their audience. So um, if let's say I want to be tastemaker, uh, was using uh, Qing Yixing uh, and, you know, extremely high quality Dehua porcelain or something um, like Kangxi Dehua, right? Uh, you know, what they say are the notes for the tea that they're drinking or whatever other item they're promoting. Um, what they talk about as they talk about these, because that's often a lot of what this um, media turns into, right? Is the tastemakers discussing a tea, talking about the flavors, how they brewed it, uh, maybe educating on the type of tea. If they use these extremely high cultural capital items that were uh, had an economic barrier to entry, uh, the majority of their audience would probably be alienated, right? So, so that is an interesting argument. How do we know that they're just not at a lower level of practice and preach from a lower level of practice? So it's easy to look down and it's hard to look up. And I think one of the problems that plagues the tea world in the West is that the minute you know anything about tea, you know more about tea than 99% of the people around you, most likely. So it is very difficult as a, as, a be as a beginner to position yourself on that cultural capital spectrum. And it's very easy to look down uh, and to try to be a tastemaker for other people that do not have know a lot about tea. It's a very populist approach to trend setting for people who, and it, oftentimes people in their experience, they're, they're new to tea themselves. So it, they have that mindset of what their journey was like um, so that they can set it because still they know more about tea than 99% of people. Um, and it's much more difficult to place other practitioners on that spectrum that are above you. I think uh, that definitely makes a lot of sense to me. I think we want to also point out that this isn't a, a value judgment on the want to be tastemakers. Um, but I think that makes a lot of sense. You're always, the more you study about tea, the more and more you just become the relative expert in the room. Um, when the majority of the world around you steeps a Lipton tea bag, uh, once you've moved into the world of loose leaf, suddenly you're some type of expert to some people. And actually, I, I don't have no negative judgment on it. It's incredibly important. It's the very top of the funnel for creating new practitioners and is, you know, admittedly not our focus here. Um, yeah, I think there's I a lot it's, of, a, it's a there's skill a lot we lack. Of, there's a lot of great people working on, on making it more approachable, um, reducing misinformation. Even since I've been uh, learning about tea since, uh, you know, 2013, um, it is amazing how much better information there is from the vendors, from bloggers, from writers. Um, it's a very different world than it was less than 10 years ago. And Ryan, you actually started learning about tea a little bit before joining the Institute in 2013. You actually used to watch a YouTube series. I don't know if you have to name it, but what, what do you, looking down now, what do you see or think about that YouTube series that helped get you into tea? Oh, just basic knowledge. I mean, it is nice learning something that is obscure that many other people don't know about. Um, it's what makes all of us interesting, not only in tea, but in all other pursuits as well. Um, so there's certainly a sense of uh, building self-worth, building knowledge, new skills um, that, that comes along that, that journey. And even in those videos, looking back, I recently rewatched one actually with, with you, Jason, um, that, you know, there's some misinformation in those videos as well. Um, a lot of it's very good, but, you know, looking back, you know, certainly there were some things that I learned. Mis um, that, misinformation or simplifications? Probably oversimplifications. Yeah, they okay. better, better characterized as a simplification. I think it's important to recognize that a lot of the uh, people who are trying to be tastemakers, putting out a lot of media on tea, uh, such as the videos that you reference, are also uh, were at some point early in their tea journey. Uh, and so they're also learning as they go along. And it's totally fine to make some of the common mistakes, produce a little bit of the common uh, misinformation or do a lot of oversimplification, depending on your audience. Um, and a lot of those people go back, you know, a couple of years later. They remake a video where they put out new information to update what they had said before, because we're all learning. Uh, you know, certainly I don't think we're not going to make any mistakes in the course of making this podcast. Uh, we'll hope our audience is uh, gracious with us and uh, hopefully anything we say wrong, we'll come back and we'll fix it in the future. Just a 
a lot of mispronunciations. A lot of mispronunciations. So I was thinking of starting the um, Qing Dynasty Shipwreck Teapot Club, but you guys seem to think that that would be alienating as a YouTube series. Uh, it just depends, you know, if you uh, if you're gonna brew with these Qing Dynasty Yixings, make sure the camera doesn't get too many of your Rolexes. I know you like to wear them all the way up the forearm, but just just one Rolex in the shot is probably enough. It was actually going to be focused on uh, Jing Jen, Qing Dai shipwreck teapots, um, the Yixing teapot, the Qing Dai Yixing teapot club is a separate. Oh, okay, perfect. Well, um, unfortunately, I don't think I'll be joining either of them. But, uh, you know, if enough people subscribe to this, maybe I can join them. Switching gears a little bit, what does the Rolex brand represent to you? Inaccessible luxury. Brian? Yeah, it, it definitely on the upper end of, of inaccessible luxury. Um, but it's, it's interesting because it's like so inaccessible. I find Rolex to be less douchey than some of the other uh, luxury houses. I actually have a pretty pure perception of it. And I don't know why. I don't know what um, what leads to that. Because there's certainly some brands where you see them on some people. Um, and it's clearly signaling. The W uh, is Piranha. My favorite band. But uh, no, I, I do think there's a purity associated with brand. Um, I don't know if it's because it has such a long history and legacy um, or because of the utility of the products. I will say there's something to say for utility. Uh, so some some brands, some luxury fashion goods, right? Um, I, I think I have a very different perspective on something when I really don't understand how or why it should be used. When I see a watch, even a luxury watch, I understand it has a function. And I think I, I definitely perceive it differently because of that. Also the intention too. I mean, the drivers of costs, you know, it's not something that's made in a plastic mold. Like there are people who spend their lifetimes learning how to do it and that art. Um, and, you know, it, it's coming out of some workshop in Switzerland where you have real artisans with real skill, hundreds of years of, of lineage probably um, that, that went into that piece. Um, it's, it's not like it's just, you know, a Gucci belt. They don't massage the cows on the Gucci belt. They don't have a lineage of a hundred year long cow bull. Yeah, Kobe beef Gucci belt. Well, the Pope wears a Rolex. Why does the Pope wear a Rolex? To tell the time. He's got to know when he needs to talk to God. The real question is, why doesn't he have uh, Junya Watanabe on his wrist? The Japanese handmade wa watchmaker. Wow, oh, he doesn't make watches, but yeah. What, what's the name? It's just a famous fashion designer. He's referenced oh. in uh, Kanye West's most recent garbage album. Oh, see, I'm I'm so out of touch with high culture. There's a Japanese uh, handmade watchmaker who only makes one watch every ten years. His name is Hajime Asoka. Good non sequitur. Ryan, why does the Pope wear a Rolex? To tell the time. Tell the time reliably but maybe also to let everyone know that he can afford a Rolex. You said that you have such a pure impression of the Rolex brand. Do you have such a pure impression of the Pope's brand? The Magisterium of the Catholic Church? No. No? And so when the Pope wears a Rolex, who, what reflects on who? It is weird that you think higher of the Pope, the shepherd of the flock and the Lamb of God, because he wears a Rolex, isn't it? And yet we started this conversation discussing the power of brands and how brands represent economic capital and economic capital as a linear relationship with cultural capital in our contemporary milieu. When it's pointed out in such an arbitrary way that a leader of millions, um, the moral authority for millions, uh, can be reflected on by a brand that they choose to wear, do you think that this is at all problematic? Perhaps, but think about how jarring it would be to see the Pope wear a Swatch watch. The current Pope, um, the first Jesuit Pope, the first Pope born in the Americas, the first Pope uh, committed to a life of poverty, wears a Casio. I'm cool with that. That's one of the only watches I've ever worn. 
you know, like immediately, uh, it just feels a little bit more approachable, right? And shouldn't he feel approachable? Should the Pope feel approachable? Servant of the servants. I think he should. Brian, the question remains in your court. Do brands have too much power in our contemporary milieu? Are we happy to outsource our objectivity and our reflections of individuals to brands? I think they that brands have a ton of power. And what they're so good at is wrapping themselves up in intangible values and long legacies of intangible values. And those are incredibly persistent and time-tested and successful at communicating those intangible values, which are feelings, which are inherently hard to describe. um, And it makes it really hard to attribute why you like something, which is why LVMH is, you know, one of the richest people in the world um, is the, you know, all of their money um, is from luxury brands. Uh, I think it, it's, it's an incredibly powerful force. Uh, what is the Rolex of T-Wear? You know, it's kind of hard to think of one T-Wear brand that carries that same recognition. Uh, That's such an interesting observation. It, especially with that kind of historicity, right, Ryan? You were mentioning that time-tested. Can you think of a specific T-Wear brand that has that historicity? I think it's F1 Yixing. I don't think it's F1 Yixing. <laughs> I love F1 Yixings. Uh, don't get me wrong. You know, you you said you're starting the uh, Qing Dynasty porcelain shipwear uh, tea, you know, pot club. I'm going to start the F1 teapot club. I think it's already started on Discord probably, but um, I, I don't think they have that same level of historicity to really represent the the same level of direct impact upon a consumer's feelings that a brand like Rolex has, uh, particularly being state run, right? But I think it is so immediately recognizable as something that was expensive and is the most expensive purchase that most tea practitioners ever make. Most tea practitioners never have anything more expensive than that point we should in tea work. I think, uh, you know, this is, this is one of those ones where we really need a lot of time to actually think about, is there any other branding in, in tea wear. And I think for me, thinking of F1 Yixing as a brand is still a little tough, uh, right? Because it's a factory. Is it really a brand? But I guess you could you could take, as we talked about, you know, islands being branded, certainly a factory could be. Um, Brian, I think you're about to say a little something, but does any tea wear brands come to you as far as historically or not? I mean, we can think of modern ones, right? But historically, it's really hard. There's branding ideals like uh, in tea, like you could argue that Dragonwell is a brand that's been a long, uh, that's been around for a very long time, but it's not really a brand. It's an interesting observation. I wonder how much it has to do with capitalism. To what extent did think events like the cultural revolution really ensure that that was not going to be existing in Chinese tea ceremony, both in you know the past hundred years and I mean, we, we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the CCP. To what extent did that ensure that that w- wouldn't even be uh, a possibility? I don't know. Yeah, when I pick up, you know, my Gaiwan purchased from, uh, you know, a kiln uh, in Taiwan, do I think of it as a brand? I, I don't. I just kind of think of it as a tool. I know, you know, r- roughly where it came from, but I don't think of that kiln as a brand. I think there's so so much that we've uh, pulled away from the branding of things. I think a lot of what you had just said, Ryan, uh, has to do with a lot of what you had just said, uh, being uh, capitalism versus other you know uh, forms of governments or uh, economic systems. Uh, yeah. Without capitalism, there's not a lot of need for powerful brands, and that op- opacity, right? You, it's not like you're buying a Rolex of teapot makes cultural capital so much more important than economic capital to a certain extent. When you finally get to those final echelons, it is literally inaccessible to you because there is no guidepost. There is no, I'm buying a Rolex. Yeah, you you can't, just because you have millions of dollars doesn't mean you can buy 
a tong of, you know, 40s uh, song pin how or something. Just because you have that money doesn't mean you can do it. My penultimate question. Do we covet more expensive tea wear because it is expensive? No, I don't. I, I don't think so. I think that um, a bad piece of tea wear is a bad piece of tea wear. Jason, I've even seen you uh, purchase something that um, was claiming to be uh, uh, 19th century Yixing. And uh, you looked at it and it wasn't. It was a complete and total fake. And uh, it's sitting gathering dust um, and uh, oil splatters in your kitchen. Uh, well, to be clear, because this will come up on the podcast, I was buying from a liquidating antique dealer uh, on the internet who had trustable things predominantly on the Japanese side and uh, made some wrong claims about this pot. So this pot came as part of a set, as part of a liquidation. I did not examine the Yixing teapot, see it was fake and decide to buy it. Would have been a great deal if it was real. But I mean, I, who wants to use that? No one wants to use that. Like, you you could you could you know, it, unless I don't know it, if that's the best example though, right? Because what what I'm asking is, are the pieces that are rare and expensive, rare and expensive because they are desired, because they are good, because they bring better tea? Are they, or do they? What? Why are they coveted? What? Right? If if so few people can use these rare and expensive wa- rare wares because they are rare and expensive, where are they gaining the experiences in which to appreciate them? Where are they gaining the desire in which to covet them and think to themselves, that is good, I want that, I want to use that? I think you actually s- skipped from asking, are they coveted to why are they coveted? Because I still don't think in our milieu, at least for Western the general uh, practitioner base of Western uh, tea ceremony practitioners, I don't believe that expensive and rare wares are coveted. Um, I believe that f- the reason is that they're not well known about. I don't think the majority of Western tea practitioners care about antique wares, particularly uh, outside of, uh, let's just say, not truly antique, but outside of Yixing's that are uh, you know, within, made within the past hundred years. I don't think that the Western tea practitioners care about antiques or many of the other extremely rare or coveted things um, that are coveted in some of the other milus of tea ceremony outside of maybe our one. Um, so I, I, I'd say no. And I think some of that has to do with uh, some of the uh, framework of tea, especially how it's been spread throughout uh, you know, the Western culture. Uh, a lot of the kind of Buddhist, Taoist, Confucianist ideals have moved with it. And some of that has to do with not coveting, right? Uh, Not holding on to greed, riches, not chasing those kind of, uh, you know, golden dragons. Um, I think some of that mindset is within the Western tea, you know, practicing community. And uh, for that reason, I don't think we see a lot of people who really want, you know, shipwreck cups the way that you do, Jason. And you cut? And the way that I do, yes. Um, I, I want to say that I, while I try not to search for these items, why, while, while I try to actively resist, uh, my desire for some of these items, the desire is there. And is it there because I want these items or is it there because I've seen people use these items and I've seen people tell me that these items are of high cultural capital and I've drank out of some of these items with you and they produced awesome tea. Uh, yes, that might be part of the reason I want them. So you covet, but attempt not to purchase. Uh, you know, I, I, I covet, attempt to find ways to use without spending my own money on them. A friendship of convenience. Uh, I'd say it's more of a love of convenience. Love of convenience. I, I love this convenience as well. My I love final, you and your convenience, yes. My final question. <laughs> Is the culture of tea apart from the culture or a part of the culture? Can you repeat the question? Of course. Is the culture of tea apart from the culture or a part of the culture? Allow me to preface this. When we work deeply in the food and beverage industry and sometimes in the alcoholic beverage industry, and when we meet beer people, breweries tend to be in cities or at least in large towns. When we meet people uh, who are working in the beer industry, they tend to be 
uh, university educated. They tend to be worldly. They tend to be travel. They tend to be uh, individuals that we would normally uh, interact with in a city environment. When we work in the wine industry, those individuals tend to be farmers, individuals who grew up on farms, who grew up on vineyards, who are uh, individuals of land and soil who are used to living outside of cities in more rural areas. And the interaction between the beer and the wine industry is very much the opposite of what you would expect uh, because wine is so highly valued and so expensive and people collect wine. And beer, until very recently, until the craft beer movement, was beer. And so beer is very much um, either a part of or a part from the culture as is wine. And so when we look at tea, is tea a part of the culture or a part from the culture? In the Western world, definitely a part from the culture. It's much more insular. It's, its own small community. It's not part of any greater, um, it's not part of the greater cultural experience of most people in the West. In, in, in the East, I think it's a different story. It's the opposite. And Pat, historically? It is fun to think about that historically because tea was actually a huge part of our culture. Uh, if you want to think about, you know, uh, the, how, how the War of Independence started for the U.S., right? It's throwing tea off a ship, um, or at least that act, right, helped to catalyze uh, the U.S. Um, I would say that as we look at our mainstream milieu, I agree with Ryan. It is not part of the larger culture. If I start talking about tea, uh, it is not a good stand-in for the rest of my personality. I can't stand on my, my appreciation of tea to get me through a conversation at a dinner party uh, with most people. Um, you know, if I show off my collection of uh, leaves aging in a, you know, humidity controlled uh, chamber, it doesn't make me cool. Uh, it makes me pretty weird to most people. Um, so just like, you know, uh, having extremely expensive or rare bottles of bourbon doesn't stand in for a personality, uh, neither does tea really. Uh, and so I do think it's apart from a culture, apart from the culture here. I've always been interested in the idea that a cha ren, dynastic Chinese cha ren, people of tea, people seeped in tea culture always pretended to be apart from the culture, we were, we're influenced and uh, inspired by aesthetics and monks and mendicants and wanderers and hermits and would say, I'm gonna go off into the mountains and I'm going to live alone in my scholar studio, my thatched hut, on, um, Sao Tang, and uh, high on this mountain and drink my tea and read my books and paint my scrolls. And maybe I'll have visitors from time to time. In reality, really, they actually just all lived in the cities and, hung out with each other and showed off their scrolls and brewed each other their expensive teas. So historically, dynastically, tea was inspired to be apart from the culture, but actually was really always a part of the culture. Do we see the opposite now? How is that influence our contemporary practice or our contemporary ideals? I think we still really hold on to that ideal of um, tea being a means for us separating ourselves from the dust of the world, right? Um, I think all of that, uh, all of us, even if we don't follow a very spiritual tea path, um, we really do take that practice to heart. I, you know, brew tea here in Seattle, right? But I'm really brewing tea in my tea room. Um, and it's not so loud outside my tea room, especially when I shut the door and, uh, or shut the window. And when I shut the door, suddenly the tea room is very quiet and I can really concentrate. And it's just me and the tea. Um, apart from my cell phone, you know, I don't, I don't take Instagram to my tea table and suddenly I, I feel that I am apart from the culture. Um, and certainly I'm trying to emulate the aesthetic that was, uh, you know, really, uh, idealized by those dynastic Chinese scholars that you mentioned. Um, do you, do you feel like you see a lot of tea people who really are trying to incorporate their practice of tea into the things that are within our mainstream milieu really uh, idealized or accepted? Well, I think that this is the difference between you and Ryan, because Ryan brings his phone and does it all for the gram. I, <laughs> Ryan is insta-famous at this point. So I, I think that that is a real difference. 
I mean, if you're not doing it for the gram, why are you doing it? I don't know why I brew tea then. If it's not to take pictures of it, then why, why would I even do it? Ryan. I think it's been over a year since I posted the tea photo. You get, you get it out of your system on the tea technique Instagram. Yes. Uh, it's been mostly Pat lately. All credit due. Thank you. But I, I would say, Jason, do you feel like we were touching upon what you were looking for there? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I think that uh, I think that there is a real attempt to make tea a bigger part of the culture. I think that that's happened because of uh, the rise of interest in tea and the health benefits of tea and the ability of quote unquote specialty tea. Right. Um, I, I do think that there are movements and individuals attempting to make tea part of the culture. And I think that there is both resistance on the spiritual side uh, and acceptance and drive on the connoisseurship side. And, you know, I don't know who will who will win that um, other than to say the adoption will probably only accelerate. But is it the adoption of practices that we as practitioners endorse and desire to see in the broader well, you said, I don't know who will win that. I'll tell you who I want to win that, uh, the tea farmers. <laughs> hopefully, uh, you know, as more people pick up a tea practice, hopefully, you know, that uh, ends up hitting the bottom lines of tea farmers and uh, not just lining, you know, the pockets of every merchant left, right, and center. That is all the questions that I have today. Are there any questions that you would like to ask me? Well, that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you everyone for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for a discussion of the next chapter, Evolution and You.